Well, good morning, church. Let's uh, grab our Bibles and open up to Romans 13. If you have a device that accesses the scripture or you brought a Bible this morning, we will be reading and teaching from the New King James Version. And we're going to pick up in Romans 13, starting in verse 8. That's right where we left off last week. And as has been mentioned through the announcements and even as you walk into our campus uh, this morning, you'll see kind of the the theme of our series through this book has been entitled Good News. And that truly is not just the, um, the theme of our time in the scriptures, but really the theme of the whole book. And this morning, if I were to give a title to kind of our time in these three short but powerful verses, this is kind of how I would entitle our time together this morning. You owe me nothing but love. Now, that probably doesn't make any sense right now, but hopefully uh, as we navigate through these three, three simple and short but really profound scriptures this morning, I hope this little phrase is something that will rattle around in your mind throughout this week as you seek to live life in response to who you are as a believer. And this morning, you kind of have to think of it like this. What we'll be considering three verses, you may say, thank God Neil is only teaching three verses. That means it's going to stay less than an hour. But honestly, to more, this morning, is, it's more like an exhortation than it is really diving into new concepts or themes or ideas that Paul is going to bring up in the book of Romans. But it's this, this exhortation to live in such a way in light of who we are. In light of who we are. In light of who God is and what he has done. And as I mentioned, the good news, it's the theme of this book, it's the the theme of our series, but it's very simply just the gospel of Jesus. And perhaps you've heard of this well-known pastor from a couple of generations ago. He was known as the Prince of Preachers, a guy that could speak in such a way that before there was media like there is today where word can get out instantaneously about things, he would draw crowds that had really never been seen before in England. And this pastor known as Charles Spurgeon, he developed this very simple way of sharing and showing and telling the gospel to children. I think I've even referenced it once before in a message in this series through the book of Romans. But it's this concept of the wordless book. Through some very basic colors, you can kind of share and show the message of the gospel. And it starts with this simple color, gold. And the gospel is truly this, that God is good. God is right. God is true. God is the creator and he's also the judge, but he's a just judge. And he's faithful. Even as Pastor John mentioned just a few moments ago, his mercies are new every morning. This is what that means. Every single day when you wake up, God is consistent. He's the same. He's faithful. He's dependable. Now, I don't know about you, but I can take that for granted and say, well, yeah, God's mercies, they're true, they're they're everlasting, they're fresh every day. But here's the deal. Those that follow the Islamic faith, who, who serve a God known as Allah, the Quran teaches them that Allah is not anything but capricious. You say, what do you mean? He can change. That means you could wake up that day and the day before you felt like you were in his good graces, but now you're not. Here's the good news. God is good. He's faithful. He's dependable. He's trustworthy. He doesn't change on you. And the Bible teaches that sin has entered the world. And sin is something that each and every single person is born into. But God sent his son Jesus and through his death and not just his death but his resurrection the fact that he beat death rose again three days later after dying on a cross for our sins he makes us pure white as snow holy justified forgiven this is kind of the simple way that Charles Spurgeon developed this Well, what he called the wordless book. Maybe you've seen the bracelets before that have the little beads that if you ever went to a VBS, I don't know if they're doing it this week or not, but it's one of those crafts that you make with kids. But here's the deal. As you walk through the book of Romans, you see this same kind of illustration 
of the gospel. I mean, look at how this book unfolds. In chapters one through four, this is what Paul begins to show very simply. God's rightness, that he is good. And in chapters one through four, he talks about and discusses how all of us, Romans 3, 23, were separated by God because of sin. But through his son, Jesus, we're made right. And that's what chapters five through eight talk about. This, this whole idea that there's this, this new humanity that's been forgiven. And it's not about whether you're, you're slave or free, Jew or Gentile. We're one in Christ. And then he takes chapters 9, 10, and 11 and shows, listen, this is who God is. He's faithful. He's good on his word. And he takes chapters 9 through 11 to show us through the nation of Israel. Anyone ever looked at the Old Testament before? There's this people group that's talked about quite a bit, the Jewish people. He says, look, all that is still in play. And then where we are right now, we're in chapter 13. We're in this fourth and final section where he talks about how the good news is that which unifies the church and shows you how to live. How to live in light of who you are because of what God has done. See, as we've been working through the book of Romans, we've considered the the gold, the black, the red, the white, and now where we are is considering, well, how should we live in light of who God is? Now, here's the deal. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. Don't get this backwards. Religion gets this backwards. We look at chapters 12 through 16 and go, okay, this is what I got to do. This is how I need to live. Because I'm a Southern Christian or this is the way I need to live because that's just what I'm supposed to be. You must fully embrace and enjoy and receive all that the Bible teaches about who God is and who he's made you to be before you start to learn how to behave. If you focus on how to behave before you learn who you're called to be, you'll find Christianity extremely boring, extremely frustrating, extremely irrelevant. You can always tell someone who doesn't quite get it because they see Christianity as a drag. They see sermons as this opportunity to just finally catch a nap, right? Like they see church as an obligation. They see worship as... Ah, routine. It's because you've missed the gospel. You've missed the gospel. You've missed the beauty and the glory and the grandeur and the mystery of God invading a life and changing you from darkness to light and transforming your heart to where you actually begin to fall in love with God. And so here's what I want to do this morning. Remember, we're just going to look at three verses. They're more exhortive. I mean, they're just kind of calling us to how we should live than anything else, but I want to ensure that you get this sense and that you get this understanding that we do these things in light of what God has done. In chapter 12 is really where the page begins to turn and we begin to see how to live. He says in chapter 12, verse 1, I'll just read it to you. Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, these two verses in chapter 12 are kind of like the foundation of everything we're gonna learn this morning, but everything that's in those last few chapters of the book of Romans. Paul writes, this is the lifestyle of a believer. Give everything to God. He he phrases it in this way of becoming a, a living sacrifice. And he says, and change the way you think. See, here's the worldly, the fleshly, and just the flat out wrong perspective. Look out for number one. Nobody else is gonna do you any favors in life, so you gotta get yours. Protect yourself from others. Make sure you do everything in life to where you are taking care of you. That's the worldly mindset. That's the the mindset of the God of this age, the God of this world, the enemy. Live for self, live to gain. And the way you think, the way you process things, well, just use reason. 
the bottom line, make it pragmatic, whatever works, or if you're a little bit more emotionally driven, then just follow your heart. That's the world's perspective on life. But here's what we learn from Romans 12. Listen, the godly, the spiritual, the right perspective, give your life to God and to others. Die to yourself and live for others. And think biblically. Think according to God's word. That, that's Romans 12, 1 and 2. See, here's the deal. The Christian life is an entirely different lifestyle than an unchristian life. See, Christians live for God, not for themselves. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In Colossians chapter 3, he wrote to that church, listen, you died. Your life is not about you anymore. So set your mind on things that are above. See, a Christian's lifestyle, the way to really experience health, life, vitality, and growth as a believer, first and foremost, you don't live for yourself, but you live for God. The second thing is this. Christians obey God, not self-desires. Maybe you remember that account of Jesus after he was baptized by John, who was his cousin. And Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, Matthew chapter 4 tells us. And he was tempted in various ways and we're given at least three of those in Matthew chapter 4. And every single time Jesus is tempted to follow after a way other than God's. In fact, in verse, oh, verse 3, it's recorded that the enemy says this in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus, if you're the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. I mean, that's a, a normal temptation to kind of entertain if you haven't eaten for 40 minutes you're thinking what in the world can I turn into bread or how how can I get some bread Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days he has the power to transform those rocks which are many in that area of the world into bread but Jesus's response was this listen man shouldn't live on bread alone but by every word of God the enemy is making this ploy listen do what's right by you Get yours. It's not harming anybody. But Jesus recognizes the tone of that temptation. This is self-centered, not God-centered. I live by the the word of God, not by mere bread. The enemy goes on to to even begin to twist scripture. In verse 6 of chapter 4, he says, Listen, you're the son of God. Throw yourself down. It's written in the Bible that he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands, they will bear you up lest you should dash your foot against a stone. He begins to tempt Jesus by twisting scripture, taking it out of context. I don't know if you know this, but that happens a lot in today's world. Twisting scripture, making it say what it doesn't really say so that you can benefit from it. And Jesus says this in verse seven, he said, it's written again, don't tempt God. And then lastly, he said, you know what? Jesus, if you'll just fall down and worship me, I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything this world has to offer. And Jesus responds. Away with you. It's written. You should worship the Lord God alone and him shall you serve. See, a Christian is constantly tempted. Constantly goes through life going, ah, this, that. But the reality is Christians obey God. And lastly, we don't figure everything out and then take steps in life. You know what we do? We, we walk by faith and not by sight, according to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. This is what the lifestyle of a believer looks like. And we've been learning this through the last couple of chapters that begin to talk about how to live. Chapters 12 and chapters 13, Paul opens it up in chapter 12, talking about that relationship with God. Remember? 
offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And as you read through chapter 12, he unpacks that in so many ways where your lifestyle is one in which you're living for God and God alone. You're having your mind transformed by his word. At the latter half of chapter 12, he says your relationship with God should be a lifestyle of serving him and trusting him. And then he begins to talk about your relationship with people. He says that we're to to live in community with one another. If you look at verses three through eight in chapter 12, about how we're all gifted differently. And so instead of just using our talents and gifts and abilities for ourselves, use them for one another. You know, we got to see that kind of firsthand this week in our life. My, My wife had to kind of go through somewhat of a routine like outpatient dental Uh, surgery and um, had to have a couple of teeth removed and I don't know if you've ever read these articles or seen these things pop up on social media but I saw one the other day that said superheroes exist because redheads are alive and it was like whoa what does that mean I've got a couple redheads in my life what does that what does that mean Um, it said oh there's like science I don't know if this is science but I believe it that they've just got a higher pain tolerance. I don't know if that's true, but my wife had four teeth removed and she didn't go under. under. She said, no, just give me the localized anesthesia. I'll take the shots. And she even had to have one in the middle of her procedure. I don't know why I'm telling you this. It has nothing to do with my point, but she's just powerful. All that to say, she had this procedure done. And so some of the people in the church heard about it. They knew we had five kids. They said, oh, let's make them some meals. And so I thought about that. I thought, well, you know what? Biblically, I'm going to receive that as God's good gift to me. Like Romans 12, 3 through 8. We'll take the, the handmade chicken and dumplings and the Italian macaroni and cheese. And another family in the church who just, man, goes above and beyond in the desserts. She came to our house with six trays of different kinds of desserts. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And this isn't the big, she goes, so for tomorrow, I'm thinking about making cobbler. I said, tomorrow? Like, <laughs> What are you doing? Like, there's no way we're going to be able to get through this in the week. And you know what? I did not be uh, given to the sin of gluttony. We didn't call her up and ask for the cobbler. We said, we're good. We're following Jesus. We're good with the six desserts. (laughs) But anyway, relationship with people, we're called to live in in community. Read it. It's there in the Bible. Romans 12, 3 through 8. He talks about all these different gifts. And he says, you know what? Use those. Go out. Make money. Get yours. Buy as many houses. Take as many trips. Have as many experiences as you can have. It doesn't say that. But what it does say is use your gifts for the blessing of others. And in Romans chapter 12, it even begins to talk about how to deal with difficult people. I know there's none of those people in this room. But when you meet those people outside of this room, it tells you how to live in relationship with those that, I'll just be honest, man. They're difficult. We'll just put it that way. Like, there's just challenge. And so he says, listen. Listen. In those kind of relationships, don't curse, bless. Don't avenge, allow God to take care of it. And don't withhold from them, but give. And last week, if you missed it, I want to encourage you to go on Spotify or iTunes or on YouTube and check the message out from last Sunday. Pastor John gave a phenomenal message that I think is really applicable to the day and age in which we live, is how do we live under the governing authorities that are over us? Like, what's our response as believers? Not just in what we do with our taxes, but even what we do with our social media. Like, how we live in such a way. And this morning, we're we're kind of still in that same stream of thought of how we live. And then this is what Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 8. He says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, I know in our context, you're like, okay, yeah. That's huge for what they're hearing. If you owe love to one another and love one another completely and fully, you fulfilled the law. And then he goes on to quote five of the Ten Commandments in verse 9. Look at what he says. For the commandments, you should not commit adultery, shall not murder, not steal or bear false witness or not covet. And then he says, you know, If there's any other commandment, they're all summed up in saying this, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For love does no harm to a neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, you may have forgotten or may have, it may be a little fuzzy as to 
what the context of the culture is of those who would have heard those words read aloud for the first time. Because when this letter was written, the church gathered to hear it spoken. They didn't have copies of the letter. They wasn't like, hey, let me just airdrop or text it to you unless I'll just follow along. Someone would read it and they would all be hearing it for the first time. And in order to set yourself in the sandals of what they would have been hearing, you need to catch the culture and really the temperature of that room and the division that was there. There was staunch division for those that would have been hearing that. Let me show you this one minute clip to remind you of what it would have been like. Now we know from the book of Acts that the church in Rome had existed for some time, that it was made up of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. But at one point, the Roman emperor Claudius had expelled all of the Jewish people from Rome. And then about five years later, all of those Jews, including Jesus following Jews, were allowed to return. And when they did, they found a church that had become very non-Jewish in custom and practice. And so this created lots of tension. So that by Paul's day, the Roman church was divided. People disagreed about how to follow Jesus. They were debating about whether non-Jewish Christians should celebrate the Sabbath or eat kosher or be circumcised. And so Paul wrote this letter to accomplish a few things. He wanted this divided church to become unified and for a practical purpose. He was hoping that the Roman church could become a staging ground for his mission to go even further west all the way to Spain. And so these circumstances are what motivated Paul to write out his fullest explanation of the gospel, the good news that he was announcing about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So that's the dynamic that Paul's writing to. This isn't like the happy clappy, everybody loves Jesus, we all got puka shells on, we're singing songs, like... It's not that dynamic that are, that are hearing this. They're divided. Like the, the Jewish Christians have moved back into Rome and there's those that have gotten saved and are part of the church and they're not really paying attention to like the Feast of Tabernacles. Like that comes, like cool, that, that was cool. Or, or like the Passover, like there's no big, they, they're not engaging in those things. And for those Jewish believers, this is like life to them. They've lived Torah their whole lives. Jesus is a Jew who comes to say, I've fulfilled the law. They step into this context and now there's all this bickering, all this fighting over what's important and how they should interact and what kind of stuff they should put on the calendar. And you know what Paul writes? He says, here, listen, it's not about laws, feasts, rituals. It's not a free for all where everything just goes out the window, but it's ultimately about a new lens on life. Let me say this again. It's ultimately about a new lens on life. And so he writes in verse 8, Owe no one anything. Now this is kind of a, a side note. It's, I'm going to use a big word. You go, wow, that guy read a book. Like tangential. It just means like, yeah, you know, it's just a tangent. But some have looked at this and said, Oh, this right here is a text that speaks about how we to operate as believers with our money. That, that this is, is a financial text. And let me just share this. I think it's interesting, but the main thrust of this text is relational, not financial. But there are some who have looked at this text and said, well, according to this text, it's a sin for any kind of believer to engage in any kind of financial transaction where there's debt or interest. Good, godly Christian individuals have used this text for that purpose. But the reality is the Bible doesn't forbid all borrowing or transactions that involve interest, but the Bible does forbid charging high interest or failing to pay honest debts. No one should get into debt or make contracts they can't maintain. But as believers, we're to, to live responsibly we're not to borrow beyond our ability to pay. And this principle is always true. Proverbs 22, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. But, but to make this verse apply to all kind of financial obligations, it's a bit of a stretch. Because listen, what Paul is saying here is relational. And he's using financial language to make a point. Let me read this verse again in just a couple of different translations. The New King James Owe no one anything except to love one another. The NIV, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. 
And maybe you have this paraphrase. It's not a translation, but it's that Bible called the message. It says it this way. Don't run up debts except for the huge debt of love you owe each other. Paul is saying this. Listen, it's not about laws. It's not about who's right, who's wrong. It's about an entirely different lens as a believer. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Um, Over the last couple of years, we live in Florida, right? There's water everywhere. I've got kids that range from 11, 9, 7, 5, and soon to be 2. And so my kids love to swim. But some of my younger kids, they will not touch the water unless you have purchased one of these, right? They will not get in. Their toes won't even touch it unless this face mask is on their little eyeballs. And they like those that not just cover their eyeballs, but that go completely over the nose, over the eyes. No water's getting in there, and then they'll get in the water. And even my little boy, Liam, who's about to be five, there was a season where he wore kind of, you know, some kind of floating device. He wouldn't even go underwater, but he still had to have it on, right? Like it was just his comfort thing. He had to have it. Now, here's the thing I want to say. For them, when they get into that water, especially when they go underneath, it's like a whole new world, right? Like Aladdin's just singing in the background. Like, it's just a whole new world. And to be able to see and to be able to breathe, they need these things on to be able to navigate that new atmosphere. Listen, when you become a believer, the life that you left and the life that you step into are different. It's different. And you need to step into life with a whole new lens, where you live for God, not for self, where you make decisions according to the word, not according to your emotions, not even just what's the bottom line tell you, but what does God speak to you through his word. You've got to put these goggles on as a believer every single day to open up his word, have your mind aligned with some of these basic but truths that need to be cemented into your heart God's not mad at me. He's not angry at me. He's not upset with me. He's not out to get me. His mercies are new every single morning. I need to be reminded of that daily, sometimes hourly, because I mess up all the time. All the time. Kids have a great way of showing you who you truly are. I'm in constant need of God's grace. And even as Pastor John mentioned earlier in this, in this service this morning, the enemy would sometimes love you to wake up already browbeaten before you even get out of bed. And you need to put on those goggles. No, there's no condemnation. But in that relationship with God, with others, and even the government, you've got to see things through the right lens. And that's what Paul is writing here. He says, listen, as a believer, the way you live in the green, it's a whole new world. It's a whole new lens. And here's what we're being exhorted to do today. It's very simple. He says it in verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. You know, the first time in my life that that concept and that idea really began to take root was when I was living in um, central Southern California. I just graduated Bible college from Marietta, which is just maybe 40, 50 minutes north of San Diego, and moved about three and a half hours north to a little community known as Santa Barbara and lived there for three years or so, uh, serving in a church, still going to school, that kind of thing, getting paid the whopping amount of $500 a month to serve Jesus, which was just amazing. God can provide with no matter what your salary is, but was living there, and I found myself in need of transportation for like a week or two. And one of the pastors I worked with, his name was Pastor G., He had a car that David Guzik had given to him when David, um, he lived in that area called Simi Valley and he felt called to go to Germany and to plant a Bible college. And so he gave G this car and and G said, Neil, you can borrow it. And I said, thank you, man, that's awesome. And he said, well, don't thank me yet, you haven't seen it. Um, It actually has a name, it's called the Humbler. And this was the Humbler that was given to Pastor G from Pastor David 
It was this four-door Honda hatchback. Now, I'm not sure if they still make four-door Honda hatchbacks, but the Humbler was nicknamed the Humbler because it never started. It never worked. And so Pastor David put on the dash that verse from James chapter 4 that says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Like his whole pitch was, you've got to be right with God in order for this car to work. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> and, it, and it takes a lot of humility. So I was like, okay, cool, man, I'll borrow it. Um, thank you so much for letting me borrow it. And I have the utmost respect for, for Pastor G. I mean, Pastor G, he still lives in that Santa Barbara area, as does David. I actually texted those guys earlier this week just to get this photo, but um, man, he's kind of like, like a Vato guy. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, Pastor G was this big, broad-shouldered Mexican guy with just shaved head, the dicky shorts down just past the knees, the, the white socks, the Chuck Taylors, the, the white sleeveless undershirt, just kind of a tough-looking guy. And he was our high school pastor at the church that I served at. And um, he said, Neil, I got to tell you something about the Humbler before I let you borrow it. I said, oh, okay, there's more, <laughs> more than this. He goes, yeah, the AC doesn't work. I was like, that's okay, it's Santa Barbara. I mean, you know, there's not even AC in most of the homes. Um, but he said, well, here's what I did. Instead of paying to get the AC fixed, I cut the top of the car off. Say, oh, <laughs> all right. And he said, and I kind of personalized it a little bit. I, I painted it camo. I, I took some like bullhorns and put it on front. And you can't see it from this old picture. This is before we had cameras that had phones and all that. But like there's this big chrome sticker on the top of the windshield that has the name of the church that he worked at called Reality. And so every time you would drive down the 101 and the sun would hit that thing, it was just like a beam of light into every other person driving around you. Like you had to be humble because people were cursing at you like as you were driving. Like they didn't like you at all. So I was like, oh, yeah, I can, I can drive that. Um, and he said, hey, it doesn't really start. I learned about the whole humble dynamics of how to start the thing and um, so it was an experience, like driving down the, the beaches and the mountains of Santa Barbara, Montecito, which if you know anything about that area, it's kind of close to Los Angeles. So a lot of the people in the entertainment world, you'd see around there and you're like, I'm in the humbler, man. Like, <laughs> I'm riding high in this thing. Um, so I'll never forget, like, finally, my car, I, I drove a little $5,000 two-door Saturn. I was never so happy to see that thing come back from the shop. And like, once I got into that, I felt like I was just cruising. I had made it back into life. But anyway, I was bringing the humbler back to G. And I kind of said it like tongue in cheek, like, thanks, bro. I really owe you one, you know, like, uh -huh. and he goes, you're right. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? He goes, you don't owe me nothing but love. And I'll never forget that phrase. I was like, what do you mean? I owe you love? Like, this is awkward. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you owe me nothing but love. And he would say that anytime any, he ever did. He's such a giving guy. Anything he'd ever do for people, they go, oh man, thanks bro. Oh yeah, he goes, you owe me nothing but love, but you owe me love. And it was like, what the heck does that mean? And then he would always say, well, you're the Bible college boy, right? Figure it out. I was like, all right. Um, so Romans 13, I found Romans 13. And it says it this way in that message paraphrase, don't run up debts except for the huge debt of love you owe each other. You hear this phrase often, right? Like, what's it mean to be a believer? Like, love God and love others. And you just kind of throw that around. Like, yeah, I know I'm called to love others. But as we consider this verse, I think there's something we need to see and we need to own as believers. And it's simply this. Please let me see your eyes. You actually owe love to the individuals seated in this room. Meaning your attitude, your actions, your choices, the way you speak to one another, the way you serve one another, the way you give, the way you live. You should do that from a lens of, man, I, I kind of have this, I, I'm called to love. I, I owe that to those around me. Remember a few weeks ago, I referenced this Bible called the Life Application Bible. Great Bible to pick up if you don't have one, but listen to the notes that are written in this section. It says, Christians obey the law of love, which supersedes both religious and civil laws. It's easy to excuse our indifference to others merely because we have no legal obligation to help them and even to justify harming them if our actions are technically legal. But 
Jesus does not leave loopholes in the law of love. Whenever love demands it, we are to go beyond human legal requirements and imitate the God of love. One author put it this way, it's our debt to bring Christ to the world and it's our debt to be loving to our neighbors. And I know for me, I need to be reminded of that lens. Like I need to definitely be reminded that I'm loved by God. I need that in my life because I'll look at the way that I act and go, gosh, why would you love me? (laughs) I make mistakes like I breathe is sometimes how I feel. But then I also need to put on this lens that I owe love to each person. Because I'll just be honest with you. I've heard and I've been told it's okay to be honest in church, so I'm going to embrace that truth. Like in my flesh, my desire is to do right by me. Like sometimes, and again, just, just being honest, like sometimes even if it's like not even what's best for you. That's my flesh. That's wrong. That's sinful. But I'm willing to say that most people in here, at one time or another, you kind of live that same way. Maybe you don't intentionally do it, but where you spend your time, where you spend your money, what really excites you, it's more about stuff that just kind of fills self and it's not about others and it's not about the Lord. When we love our neighbors as ourself, we're doing as God is doing. You say, what do you mean by that? I don't understand this. But according to the book of Romans, there's nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God. Believers or unbelievers, he loves every single person. The only way to experience that real relationship and actually have relationship, though, is through faith in Jesus and through repentance. But it doesn't mean God doesn't love people. For God so loved the world that whosoever believed in him, anyone in this room or watching online is a whosoever. He loves everybody. He loves everybody. It's almost like he's saying, listen, this is a debt that I'm never going to allow to be paid in full in that sense. I'm just going to keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving. And when you choose to love your neighbor, you're just simply doing what God's already been doing. And you know that about leadership, right? No good leader asks you to do something that he's not willing to do himself. And that's who God is. God says, hey, I'll go that extra mile. I'll send my son. He'll take those nails on the cross. See, God searches for and finds us so that he may love us. And he calls us to do the same. Because real love rarely happens without conscious effort. And those who actively love, they receive far more than they give. And it fulfills the law. Remember what it says there in verses 8, 9, and 10 of Romans chapter 13. He says in that latter half of verse 9 that all these commandments are summed up in this one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself for love does no harm to a neighbor and love is the fulfillment of the law. Let me just ask you a question as we close this morning. And I'm just asking you to be honest between yourself and God. Is this really how you live? In light of the gospel, please don't misunderstand this message like, you aren't loving, God's not going to love you. No, that's not the gospel. Because of who God is and because he's good and because he's dealt with the sin and sent his son and because we're made new, now we live in such a way where we love. But I just want to ask you this question. Like when you came into this building this morning, the lens that you had on, was it how can I show love to the person that's next to me? How can I be forgiving? How can I be kind? How can I be gracious? How can I lean in to loving others? Or is the lens, shoot, Neil's preaching, I hope it doesn't go long. Man, I hope that AC's working this weekend. The screens, man, I hope they're not going out. Did they got money for that playground yet? Like, like what lens do you put on when you step into your day? I'm just asking you a simple question. I'm asking myself this simple question. Do I really see life and the relationships that are around me? You know what? I owe them love. Because of what God's done for me, how could I do any less? 
And don't take this out of context. Don't misunderstand what love is. I'm not talking about being a doormat. Read 1 Corinthians 13 to find out what true love is. True love does set boundaries. And there's health in relationships. You never put yourself in an abusive relationship. I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about this attitude where it's almost like, a man, I'm paying that debt, but it's never going to be paid. I'm just going to love people, love people. I'm going to trust God with the results. Let me ask you just another question. According to what the Bible says, do you think you should? And is there anything in your life today that maybe could or should change in response to relationships and having this mindset of, I got to put these goggles on to know that, and I owe love because of what God's done for me. In light of all that God's done, this is what God calls this. This is your reasonable service. Those who actively love often receive far more than what they give. I'm going to invite the worship team up in, um, now, and we're just going to close out in a time of communion. But I want to I read this verse to you that I think really drives this home. It's 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, where he writes, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for others.